I first came to Cleveland in 1987, there was a radio host named Merle Paulus. And every morning he'd begin his radio show saying as loudly as he possibly could, good morning. Let's try that together. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Great to have you here. <clears throat> Looking forward to a time of praise and worship and thanksgiving. A time of music and prayer and reflection, spoken word, and the uplifting of God's name and glory. Thank you for coming. May God bless us as we gather and let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us today and melt us and mold us and fill us and use us to your glory. Be among us as you promised that wherever two or three are gathered together in your name, there you will be in the midst. And so we say good morning to you and thank you for the gift of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. And good morning, First Baptist. Please take a moment, look across the aisles, say hello to your neighbor, greet that person you have not seen all week. Amen. Howdy, neighbor. Howdy, choir. Howdy, praise man. Hello, Brian and Demi and Pete and Adam and Kelly and Jared. Morning, Jeff, Karen. Morning, Raquel. Wait, what's the make it on make it glorious, make it wonderful, make it excellent the praises of our King. Make it glorious, stand with us, make it wonderful. Make it excellent, the praises of our King. Sing with us if you can. Make it glorious, make it wonderful. Make it excellent, the praises of our King. Make it glorious, make it wonderful, the praises of our King. Sing praises to our King. Make it excellent. Make it beautiful. The praises of our King. Our King, our King. Let Him hear how much we really thank Him. Sing praises to our King. Now give joy to our God, for the earth sing glory to His name. He deserves nothing less than our hearts and souls are very Oh, 
your voice in praise and sing with me right now. Make it glorious, make it wonderful, make it excellent, the praises of our King. Come on, choir. Make, make it, it glorious, make it wonderful, make it excellent, the praises of our King. Sing it again. Make it glorious, make it wonderful, make it excellent, the praises of our King. Make it glorious, make it wonderful, make it excellent, the praises of our King. Now let's shout for joy. Shout for joy. today. Hallelujah. If God has seen you through a week, no matter what the circumstance. And I want to hear you say amen if God has reminded you of his grace this week. If you've been reminded of God's love, God's understanding by maybe even just the people who show up for you, that lets you know that God's love endures forever in every circumstance. And that in this season of Eastertide, we celebrate that commitment through that sacrifice, that if we but believe, that if we have not just a mustard seed of faith, we shall not perish, because God will never leave nor forsake us. Amen? Jeff knows this one. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Forever and ever, forever God. 
endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. And as we stand before the Lord, asking God to be our firm foundation, asking God to fulfill, refresh, and renew us. We ask, what does God expect from us? What can God find in us? What seeds are being planted in us that we might remain steadfast? That the things that are not of God might be moved out of our way, even if that's us at some times. I had this thought this week. The Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall proper, prosper. But what if I'm the weapon sometimes? What if I'm standing in my own way? What if my mind has obscured my heart to God's love? So I ask you right now to bring yourself before the Lord and let God search you. Let God identify those things in you, maybe the broken things, maybe the confused things, maybe the things that are doubtful. And I ask you to turn those things over to God so that you might be made perfectly imperfect for his grace, for God's love and God's understanding today and moving forward. Amen. Test me, oh God. Test me, oh God, and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me. petition the Lord right now. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me, O oh God, and know my thoughts. See if there be
Amen. I love the words to those songs. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. We're going to have a time of prayer now. We do that because we believe in the power of prayer. Amen? Amen. When we pray, God's power is unleashed and we need it as individuals and as a church. In a moment, we'll have some people ready to receive your prayer requests, but I want to say uh, two things first. One, I'd like us to pray uh, for Barb Coiner. Barb has not been in church for a while. She is uh, struggling with stage four breast cancer. Every day is a struggle for her just to function. And uh, this week, again, she's in the hospital today. Uh, and she just needs your prayers to lift her up and ask God to bring her strength. She still has a great hope. Uh, she's not given up. Uh, but every day is a struggle. So she needs your prayers. Second, on behalf of the uh, pastoral search team, uh, we want to ask you to pray right now, especially for discernment for the 12 or 13 of us on the team. Let me tell you where things stand real quick so you have an idea. So far, we have received indications that there are 38 interested candidates looking for the job as our senior pastor. Uh, immediately, 19 of them were disqualified because they simply did not meet the minimum requirements that we set. But out of the 19 that are left, we're waiting to hear more from 11 of them because there's a process they have to go through to create a profile. Of the uh, eight that we have uh, received profiles for, four of them we have given a first interview to, which means that four of them have already washed out. But there are four candidates that we've given a first interview to, and we will start giving second interviews to candidates uh, even as early as this week. Uh, Dan Meisner, who's been on both search teams, both for Craig and the current search team, he says there is a world of difference in the quality of candidates that we're seeing now than what we saw eight, nine years ago when we hired Craig. So we are already certain that we're going to be choosing between great candidates when we ultimately make our choice. But it is a choice that we have to make, and we want to follow the Lord's leading. And so we're asking you to pray for each member as they're going through profiles and making decisions. Do I want to hear more from this candidate? Am I excited about this one? Or is this one that would be great in any church, but not for us? So please be praying for us. Now, how can we pray for you? If you have a request, just raise your hand. Michael will bring a microphone to you. Kelly will bring a microphone to you. And we want to hear what you need us to pray for. Good morning, church. Uh, first of all, I have a praise. I want to thank you. Uh, I told you my daughter, Lindsay, was sick with pneumonia, but she's well. She's back to school and back to her normal self. Uh, and also, another praise, little Tara is now 21 years old today, my oldest Ooh. daughter. So. Just wow. uh, feeling Praise blessed. Praise God. Someone else? Hi, good morning. I'm Julie. Um, a while ago, I asked for prayers for my Aunt Mary, who had a brain aneurysm. Um, she's, doing, she's doing okay. She's out of the hospital, um, but I just want to continue to ask for healing prayers for her. Um, and also, um, her. she's, I don't know how to say it, but um, my... Mom and her siblings are trying to get her into a safer place to go to um, after she's well. So just prayers for that. Hi, my name is Michael. Um, prayers for my wife, for a special intention this week. She's got a really good opportunity uh, ahead of her. Uh, so just want to lift her up and give her the encouragement she needs and deserves. And also another praise, um, someone who participated in Jesus Christ Superstar um, and is going through some things in their own life has expressed interest in coming to First Baptist. Uh, and that's always a blessing. They were able to come here and experience fellowship and get to know more about our congregation and would like to come find out what it's all about. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. 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 Is there I'd anyone like else? Ask, good morning. I'd like to ask the church a prayer for my sister. Um, ironically, last week when so many people had prayers about help, um, I looked at Emory, and then we both were saying that we were just so blessed. And then a couple of days later, my sister um, had to have emergency surgery. So 
um, she's out of uh, the hospital, but I want to have a prayer, please, for her continual health. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is... I'm on? Okay. Hi, my name is David. I visited our former choir director, Stephanie, um, down in Texas, and her son, who just turned 13, mm -hmm. no longer has epilepsy. I yes. don't know how that's possible, but I guess it was a form of epilepsy that sometimes disappears when they hit their teens. So thank God for that. Well, then, would you join me as we pray together? One more. Thank you. Pray for Reverend Marvin McMichael. Absolutely. Let's pray. Father, from, from Psalm 103, we lift up your name and we bless your name, God, because you have pardoned all of our iniquities. You have healed all our diseases. You have redeemed our lives from the pit. You have crowned us with loving kindness and compassion. You have satisfied our years with good things, and you perform righteous deeds in our lives. God, for the blessings of our relationship with you, we give you thanks. We praise you this morning for who you are. And we confess, as our song said, God, that when we look deep within our hearts, we recognize that there are wicked ways within us. We want to follow you better, but sometimes we get in the way. So we ask your forgiveness, God, that you would pour your grace and your forgiveness out upon us one more time, yet one more time, but also gird our hearts that we might walk in righteousness with you. Father, you know that we have great needs. You've heard requests this morning for healing, for guidance, for discernment. God, we lift these prayers up to you and ask that whatever the situation is, whatever the circumstances, that you would reign over the lives of those individuals, that you would reign over the life and the direction of our church, that we would walk in step with you, that we would be in sync with what you want for us, because we know that what you want for us is the absolute best for us. But we look beyond these walls, God. We look at a community that's hurting in many ways, we look at a world that is filled with conflict as, as Lebanon and Israel are exchanging missiles one with the other. God, we pray for peace in that land. We pray that saner minds would, would, would bring that conflict to an end. We pray for the war between Russia and Ukraine, Lord, and ask again that you would bring peace to the hearts of those in leadership that they would cease the fighting. God, we ask that in this year, as America has so many decisions to make regarding its future and those who will lead us, that you would help us to have that sense of wisdom and discernment, to know what is best, to know who is best, and to know how we ought to vote. God, we thank you that we have the privilege of making those choices, that we have the privilege of whether or not we come to church, that we have the privilege of how much you have blessed this land, knowing that you also expect much in return. But Lord, as we walk through this next week, whatever it may yield in our lives, we pray that you would walk side by side with us, that you would guide us, that you would push us in the right direction when we need to be pushed and that you would help us to live that lives as a witness for you wherever we go. We pray for Dr. McMickle this week, Lord, knowing that it's a challenge to get up and to preach each week. It's a challenge to lead us in study. It's a challenge uh, just to guide our church through this process. And so we pray for strength, for, for everything that he needs to be the kind of man you want him to be and that we're enjoying 
as he works with us. We pray for our future pastor, wherever he or she may be, knowing, God, that you will lead us to that person. You will make it clear to us who the right choice is. But whoever it is, we ask that you're doing a marvelous work in their lives right now as they understand that the change is coming for them as well. We pray, God, that you would match us with just the right person who will lead us into our future. And so we look forward to what's going to happen. We look forward to life, Lord, because you are good and your loving kindness endures forever. And so as we go into this next week, we do so with our heads held high, with confidence, knowing that you are there with us at all times and in all circumstances. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for being there for us. And we ask these prayers in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Good morning, First Baptist. This is our stewardship time, and I thank you in advance for gifts that you have provided and continue to provide to the church. We have many ways for you to give. Shortly, the ushers will be coming forward with offering plates. There are kiosks where you can drop donations throughout the building, and you can always visit our website at any time of the day. It is two weeks after Resurrection Sunday, so I thought this would be a good time to reflect on the Great Commission, which can be found in the last two verses of the book of Matthew, where, it said, where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and remember that I am with you always to the end of the age. In our stewardship, we recognize the importance of ministering not only to our local church community, but to extending that to communities of all types throughout the globe. And here at First Baptist, we seek to allocate at least 10% of the gifts that you share with us with various missions, of which we have several, that include but are not limited to PADS, Ministries of the First Baptist Church of Managua in Nicaragua, Hunger Gardens, Food Pantries, Eastside Ministries, not including the various community groups that make use of our building throughout the week. All of that is enabled by your support, and so I thank you for it. Together, we are fulfilling God's call to share his story and love and gospel with the world. Lord is my shepherd, he goes before me, defender behind me, I won't fear. I'm filled with anointing, my cup's overflowing, no weapon can harm me, I won't fear. Hallelujah, I am not alone. He's my comfort, always holds me close. He always guides. Mountains and valleys, his joy is refreshing, restores my soul. Mercy. 
Let the church say amen. amen. We've had some beautiful music, and uh, they've all carried powerful messages, and it is good that we are all here today. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful that in these moments we can be in this place, that with all that is going on in the world around us, not just rumors of war, but actual war in the Sudan, in Ukraine, in Israel, in Iraq, in Iran, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in places all over the world, we are overwhelmed 
by the evil that sometimes manifests itself. But as the song has just said, we are not alone. And the God that we serve is greater than the problems that we face. Hallelujah. Christ really does reign. God is sovereign. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world is our prayer and our promise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite your attention to a portion of scripture that is found in the book of Acts chapter 1, reading verses 6 through 8. I want to set the context again. Uh, we are following a, ca a calendar uh, that begins with Easter and then extends so that as long as there are activities going on in the biblical story that involve Jesus in his post-resurrection experience, we want to follow that path right to the end, right until the Lord is taken up into glory, which is this text. So to preach from this passage is to follow the literal historical narrative uh, from the resurrection of Jesus until his uh, departure 40 days later into glory. And we are right at the cusp of that with this passage, beginning on verse 6 of Acts chapter 1. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I might as well go on to verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Thus ends Jesus' earthly ministry. Thus ends our reading. If you had the opportunity to ask from Jesus any one thing. If the Lord said to you, I will give you the desire of your heart, but only one thing, what would you ask for? Would you ask for earthly wealth? Would you ask for uncanny wisdom? Would you ask that you be given some place of prominence in society? Would you ask for a healing for yourself? If you could ask the Lord for any one thing, believing beyond the shadow of a doubt that it could be done, what would you ask for? I phrase the question that way because there is a sense in which that is what has happened here. It is almost as if Jesus has said to them, I'm about to leave. Our time together has come to an end. But before I depart, is there any one last thing you want? Any one last question that I can answer? Any last act that I can perform? Before I'm gone from this earthly scene, what can I do for you? Now, knowing that they could have asked for anything and it could have been accomplished, here's what they say to Jesus. Here is their last inquiry. Lord, will you at this time Restore the kingdom to Israel. That's what you want to know? The last thing you want from me is to restore Israel to its former glory? Is that what you think this is about? 
You think I came down through 42 generations, came out of the virgin womb of Mary, was raised up in Bethlehem and Nazareth, died a terrible death on the cross. You think I went through all of that so that at the end, the finished product would be that Israel might be restored to its former glory? Is that what you think this is about? If not that, then what? The disciples really did think that Jesus was the Messiah, and at that point in history, their sense of what the Messiah did was a restorative ministry. They wanted Israel, which at that point was a tiny little nation in the backwaters of the Roman Empire. They wanted that nation to once again assume the power and the glory and the prestige they had in the days of David and Solomon a thousand years earlier. Take us back to the good old days. Make Israel great again. And the Lord said, that's not why I came. I didn't come to restore past experiences. I did not come to reestablish past relationships. I do not deal in what has already been. I've come to do a new thing. If only our nation could understand that. God is not interested in restoring America to any previous past. There is no point in America's history to which God wants us to return because whatever point in the past we return to, somebody was on the short end of the stick. Make America great again when? Before the 1965 Voting Rights Act? Then? Before 1920 when women could not vote? Then? Before child labor laws went into effect? Then? Before slavery was ended? Then? Before Native American tribes were uprooted? Then? Precisely when is it to which we want to return? to make it great again. They wanted to go back to some glorious past. And Jesus says, I didn't come for your past. I came to push you into a new future. What I want from you is not to ask you about where you've been. I want to give you a new assignment, First Baptist Church. I want First Baptist Church of Greater Cleveland to be my witness. That every time somebody looks at you, thinks about you, visits with you, what they see in you is a reflection of me, says Jesus. Be my public representative. But every word that you speak, every act you perform, every ministry in which you are engaged, let that not only reflect your values, but the values of the kingdom of God on earth. Be my witness. I take this text when I discovered last week, courtesy of the planning committee, that next Sunday is your mission emphasis Sunday. And you are thinking about preparing for a mission trip to Nicaragua. And you want to commission a group of people to engage in that mission project. And they asked me if there was a text that I could use that might set the stage for a mission venture. And I thought at first of Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, which really swings in two directions. On the first half, it is the what that God desires. Be my witness. That's today. And on the other hand, it's the where that God desires. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. God wants your witness. God wants your ministry. God wants your outreach. God wants your impact to not be limited to your sanctuary. 
or to your city or to your county or to your state or to your country. God wants God's people to be God's witness everywhere that the divine footprint has been set down in all of creation. Nicaragua as an example. Be my witness. Think of the word. Be my witness. I watched a motion picture called 42. It's about Jackie Robinson. Joined the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. And they played a game in Cincinnati. At that time, Cincinnati was, was about as far south as Major League Baseball was being played in terms of having an organized team, Southern Ohio. And there was a little boy sitting in the stands with his father. And Robinson came out. He was playing first base at the time. And all of a sudden, the fans in Cincinnati began to refer to Jackie Robinson over and over and over again by the N-word, which I will not repeat. Hey, in, hey, in, 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 in. Just overwhelming all over the stadium. The little boy looked at his father to see what his father was going to do. And all of a sudden, his father joined the chorus. In, 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 in. And because he saw his father engaging in this ridicule, this little boy began to join the chant. In, 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 in. Then the camera shifts to Pee Wee Reese, the shortstop for the Brooklyn Dodgers. While all of the people in the stadium are hurling this racial slur at Jackie Robinson, Pee Wee Reese, white baseball player, goes from shortstop to first base, puts his arm around the shoulder of Jackie Robinson, knowing that he, Pee Wee Reese from Kentucky, had people in the stands who had known him all his life. And he said to Jackie Robinson, I just want you to know that I'm here with you. Now, whose witness do you think was most pleasing to God? Whose public demeanor, whose Whose expression do you think most reflected the reign, R-E-I-G-N, the reign of God on earth? Those, those whose racial biases caused them to hurl insults at Jackie Robinson or the simple gesture of one of his teammates going to his side, standing with him, wrapping his arm around his shoulder and saying, just so you know, I'm here with you. Everything we do is a witness. Every action we take is a witness. Somebody is observing us, if not at least at all times, at least in critical moments to find out whether or not we're, we're living up to the standards that we've claimed for ourselves. Jesus says, more than I want anything else from you, I want you to be my witness. I want you to look like me, act like me, live like me, speak up for me. Be my witness. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the end of the earth. What is a witness? I mean, in, in practical terms, what is a witness? Well, on the one hand, it's a person who sees something. A witness speaks of what they have seen. I saw this, I can bear witness to that. I observed this, I can bear witness to that. I'm inviting people in this congregation to pay attention to what you see going on in the world around you. You cannot respond to evil if you are not paying attention to the world around you. There are starving people in the world, do you see? There is, there is too much gun violence in the world, do we see it? 
There's too much political strife, too much division. Do we see it or are we just burying our heads as if it does not matter? The first thing we have to do to be a witness is to pay attention to what is going on. We are on the brink of another world war. If things go wrong between Russia and Ukraine, between Iran and Israel, who knows where this thing may go? We have to at least see where the world is headed. Be my witness. Look at the world through the lens and the eyes of Jesus Christ. And ask yourself, where do you think he would like to see things moving? I guarantee you, he, he would not be the least bit interested in asking for a ceasefire on Monday in Israel and then send Israel two and three and four thousand pound bombs on the next day. Be my witness. Look like me, act like me, value what I value. Be my, see something. But once you've seen something, the, the second part of being a witness, a kind of a, in the courtroom, perspective is to say something about what you've seen, to speak the truth, to dare to say no, to dare to say yes, to declare where you are on any particular day, on any particular issue, on any particular topic. You cannot be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ and be popular with everybody, every day, everywhere. There ought to be somebody somewhere who doesn't want to see you coming. Because you're bringing with you a value system that is contrary to theirs from which you will not move. Speak the truth. That's what you swear to do in a courtroom. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. And the answer is I do. I, I promise to be a witness to what I have seen. And then having seen something and having the courage and the truth to say something about what you have seen, be prepared for the pushback to suffer something because of what you've said, because of what you've seen. I believe the world is the way the world is, not because we don't know it's wrong, but because we are afraid of the consequences if we say anything about it. I don't want to be criticized. I don't want to be isolated. I don't want to be ostracized. I don't want to lose my status in some particular social circle, political circle, cultural circle. I just don't want the aggravation. I'll just sit here and be quiet. I don't like it. I can't stand it. But I won't say anything about it because I'm afraid I may have to suffer something. And yet, most of the people who've made the biggest impact on the history of the world have been the ones who were prepared to suffer something for the sake of what they believed. Who are not confined by the limits of momentary popularity. Prepared to rise above what seemed at the moment to be politically expedient or politically correct, and just said what the Lord had laid upon their hearts. That's why women are voting, because at some point, your previous generations of those who advocated for that right, they suffered something in the process. They, they suffered for it. That's why African Americans are freed in this country, because abolitionists suffered something in the process. That's why the nation exists, no longer a colony of Great Britain. The founders suffered something for the sake of the freedom that we now enjoy. If you want to have something worth having, what are we prepared to suffer in the process of pursuing it? That's why Robert Kennedy is dead. That's why Malcolm X is dead. That's why John Kennedy is dead. That's why Martin King is dead. That's why Medgar Evers is dead. 
They had great visions, great hopes, great aspirations, and the world was not prepared to receive them. And they killed them. Now, I am not inviting anybody here to a martyr's death, but I am saying this. In the Greek language, the Greek word for witness is martyria. And martyria is the basis of the word martyr. And when Pee Wee Reese left his shortstop position in Cincinnati, Ohio, and went across the field in 1947 to stand with Jackie Robinson while the rest of the stadium was overwhelmed with racial slurs, he was running the risk of the rest of his career. He just wanted Jackie Robinson to know where he stood. So when Jesus is about to leave the earth, go back into glory, and is in theory passing the baton of the ministry of the church from his hands to ours, he tells us what it is he hopes and prays and pleads that we will do. Be my witness. Let people see me in you. Be my witness when you speak. Be my witness when you sing. Be my witness when you give tithes and offerings. Be my witness when you go off to Nicaragua to share the good news of the gospel in tangible and meaningful ways. Be my witness. When you hear some foul joke being told somewhere that you know is inappropriate, do not smile and laugh and fit in and move along. Reflect the values of Christ. Be my witness. It's what Christ himself did. Didn't try to fit in. <laughs> stood up and stood apart. And so today, as we get ready for next week and we get ready for mission emphasis in the second part of Acts chapter 1 where we are told where to go, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the end of the earth. We're also being told what to do. Be my witness. See something. Pay attention. Say something about what you've seen. Be prepared to suffer for the sake of what you have said because of what you've seen because you believe in so deeply what it is you're saying. If you're not willing to suffer some loss, some momentary inconvenience, some, some temporary loss of friends, if the cost of that friendship is your fellowship with Christ, you need to ask yourself, which is the greater value. So today, as we pause to open the doors of our church, invite you to ponder what it means to you to be a follower of Jesus. Hear the phrase, nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee. E'en though it be a cross that lifted thee. Here now my prayer shall be nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee, nearer to thee. Every day of your life, nearer to Christ. Every act that you intake, nearer to Christ. Each ministry in which you engage, nearer to Christ. More and more like him, less and less like the world around us. If you could ask the Lord for any one thing, knowing he could do it, what would you ask for? Let the Lord give you the answer in advance. Ask to be one of God's witnesses. There really isn't anything better than that. 
stand together and sing this hymn, just one stanza of hymn 606, Nearer My God to Thee. If you don't have a church home, if you uh, are looking for a place in which to worship, if you are looking for a place in which to be baptized and begin your Christian journey, if you are a student and you are here temporarily and you want to have a place uh, for watch care, whatever your condition is, we love to give people an opportunity to respond to the preaching of the gospel, to receive Christ as Lord, to embrace the idea of being one of God's witnesses, and perhaps having done that, move to the next step and do that in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Nearer my God to thee. Shall we pray? Oh Christ, you came into the world to do so much, to physically bear witness to the love and the power and the purposes of God. And as you departed from the earth and returned to the right hand of God, you gave us a simple challenge. Be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. See something. Pay attention. Say something. Speak truth to power. And be prepared as occasions will arise to suffer something for the sake of what you fervently believe. Bless us, O God, as we seek to live into that challenge. Who will be a witness for our Lord? 
May God bless you and keep you. May God cause God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up the light of God's countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.